Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Strange Extortion. Hardly a day passes that some person of large income or great wealth does not receive a letter demanding that he pay the sender a certain sum of money or suffer the consequences. The usual implication is death to himself or some member of the family. True, most of these extortion letters are written by cranks who never carry out their threats, but the FBI must investigate them all. And quite often, the letters are the real thing. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI involving attempted extortion is one of the most extraordinary stories of its kind on record. Flint Rock was a wholly appropriate name for the old secluded Long Island estate. For it not only described the volcanic outcroppings about the place, but it suited the character of the despotic old woman who ruled the cold gray stone house with perpetual ill temper and a passionate contempt for all under its jagged roof. Although Letty Bradford could seldom leave her bed, her irascible spirit haunted every room and had long since made Flint Rock a house of mutual hate. It is now one minute after nine o'clock in the morning. Letty Bradford reaches for her stick and... Janet! Janet! Oh, that stupid nurse. Janet! It's about time, young lady. Good morning, Mrs. Bradford. Nearly two minutes after nine, Janet. I'm sorry. That's no excuse. You know very well I want my breakfast at 9 o'clock, and 9 o'clock doesn't mean two minutes after 9. Yes, Mrs. Bradford. I suppose you stopped to poison the orange juice. No, Mrs. Bradford. Don't tell me the thought hasn't occurred to you. No, Mrs. Bradford. Of course it has. It's occurred to all of you. And why should it? Don't question me and don't look at me that way. You're all too impatient for me to die. You can't wait for my affliction to kill me. You're too eager to get your ungrateful fingers on the money I've left for you in my will. I don't expect any money. You've always paid me for my services. Inefficient as they are. Shall I pour your tea? Don't you always? You want me to drink it, don't you? You said for me to pour it. 
There are some poisons that cannot be detected in a body, aren't there? Yes, there are several. Hmm. I won't drink the tea. Take it away. Take it away, I say. As you wish. Well, don't stand there tapping like a woodpecker, Charles. Good morning, Mrs. Bradford. Good morning, Janet. <laughs> Another Judith. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Bradford. Take the tray, Janet. How long have you been my secretary, Charles? It will soon be ten years. Hmm. You must have robbed me of a tidy sum in that length of time. If you think I have, why don't you have me arrested? Nonsense. I admire your ability to hide your pilfering. <laughs> what have you got there? The morning mail, of course. Oh, don't bother me with mail this morning. Where's my adoring niece? Miss Darrell is... I know. Sleeping it off under a pile of ice bags. Uh, Miss Darrell stayed in New York last night. Well, they have ice bags there, too, don't they? What's that? A letter addressed to you marked confidential. Confidential poppycock. Open it. I didn't want to without your permission. Open it. Mrs. Bradford. Well? It's an extortion letter, and they threaten well, to... Well, don't have a stroke about it. But they threaten your life unless you... Unless what? Unless you pay them $30,000 by noon tomorrow. Pay who $30,000? You are to wrap up that amount in bills of small denomination and see that the package is left in the alley behind the North Shore Bank building in Island City and say nothing to the police or... Or they'll bash my head in, I suppose. I'd better get Judge Madison on the telephone right away. You'll do nothing of the sort. Some crank nonsense. Throw the letter away. But, Mrs. Bradford... You heard me throw it away. Very well. Charles. Wait a minute. Yes? Why should anyone ask for $30,000? Why not 25000 or fifty, or 100000 Why 30000 It is an odd amount. Ah. There may be something to this after all, Charles. Get Judge Madison over here right away. I wouldn't be surprised if all this weren't some scheme of your own, Tom Madison. Oh, my dear Letty. Of course, I could use $30,000 to good advantage, but... Can't uh... you wait until I die, either? As executor of the estate, you'll be able to milk it for a whole lot more than that. Uh, come now, my dear. This is a serious matter. What's serious about having my head bashed in? That would be a happy event for all of you. Oh, please, please, my dear. If the letter is a genuine extortion letter, you have until noon tomorrow... And you may rest assured, my dear, before then I'll see to it that you have ample protection. I don't want a lot of to-do about this in the papers, you understand? The FBI doesn't operate that way. What does the FBI have to do with it? This is a federal crime, and I must report it to the FBI at once. <laughs> Judge Madison drove swiftly into New York and went directly to FBI headquarters, where he reported the case to Special Agent Hugh Barnes. And here is the letter, Mr. Barnes. Uh-huh. Now, this looks like the type of stationery ordinarily used for social correspondence. And whoever sent the letter was careful to use a typewriter. A typewriting can be as incriminating, Judge Madison, as handwriting. Each set of type leaves its own peculiar mark. But they don't necessarily prove who did the typing. No, but it's a good clue anyway. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Now, who occupies the house with Mrs. Bradford? Besides the servants, there's Mrs. Bradford's personal nurse, Janice Smith. Well, what do you know about her? And not much, except that she has attended Mrs. Bradford for three years. Single? Yes. A young man calls on her once a week, I believe. Well, what's her attitude toward Mrs. Bradford? Uh, frankly, Mr. Barnes, no one has any real affection for Letty Bradford. Well, from your description of her, that's understandable. Who else lives there? Her secretary for almost ten years, Charles Forbes. Single, about uh, 34. Does Mrs. Bradford have any children or other relatives? Only a niece, Daryl Bradford, about 27. Very attractive. 
Also single? As Daryl says, she's uh, still playing the field. <laughs> uh, nightclub style. It has a generous allowance, I suppose. Not always generous enough. I've had to clear up her gambling debts from time to time. For a large sum? Well, they've varied in the past. I say past because three months ago, Mrs. Bradford swore she would never settle another one. Now, what about the servants? Well, there'd be no reason to suspect any of them, except, uh, well, uh... Except whom? The chauffeur, Floyd Parker. He likes his drink a little too much, and occasionally he's disappeared for two or three days at a time on what he calls a little bottlenecking. I see. And Mrs. Bradford says she had a row with Floyd on the subject two days ago and fired him. Anyway, Parker's gone. Morley. Yes, Barnes? Get a complete description of Floyd Parker from Judge Madison and start trying to locate him, will you? Right. There are a couple of angles I want to go out on for a while, Judge. Would you be good enough to meet me this evening at the Bradford house? Certainly. And please see that everyone's there, including Daryl Bradford. Good evening, Miss Darrell. What's good about it, Charles? I'm sorry I had to call you. You didn't tell anyone where I was? Certainly not. Thanks. Now, why should I have to come all the way out here because that old, you name it, got some kind of crazy letter? The FBI agent wanted everybody here. FBI agent? Yes. He's been all over the house for the last two hours. He's in the library now, and he's already fingerprinted all of us except you. What? Yes. You mean he... He suspects that one of us? I guess it's their job to suspect... Everybody, Miss Dell. Uh, Mr. Barnes, uh, the agent, ask me to have you come into the library as soon as you arrive. All right. I'm Daryl Bradford. They say you want my fingerprints. Oh, please, if you don't mind. Were you expecting me to object? Do you? Why should I? It'll only take a moment. Now, press your right fingers on this ink pad, please. Good Lord. wonder if I've robbed any safes lately. Well, probably not, or you would have paid off your gambling debt for Nick. Now, press your fingers on this card here. What do you know about Nick? Well, he's a dangerous man to owe $30,000 to. Now, the left fingers, please. All right, so you know about it. But I didn't write that letter. I didn't say you did, or you didn't. If I didn't, who did? I haven't found out yet how many people know about your debt. And a lot of people, including you, would benefit by Mrs. Bradford's death. Have you finished with me? Well, for now, yes. Oh, please send the nurse, Miss Smith, in, will you? And I'd rather you wouldn't leave the house. Very well. You're in charge. Barnes speaking. This is Morley. Any trace of the chauffeur? Yet. I just called to tell you I've also put out a five-state alarm for him in case he decided to roam. Good. I'll be here for a while yet. Thanks. Well? Oh, uh, this is a sheet of your stationery, isn't it, Miss Smith? Where did you get it? Out of your room. Then I guess it's mine. Why? Well, the extortion letter was written on a sheet of paper exactly like this. And that makes me guilty, I suppose. I didn't say so. If anybody wanted to get $30,000 from Mrs. Bradford, it probably would have been... Then you knew about Daryl Bradford's gambling debt? Charles knew about it. He told me. I thought he was supposed to be a confidential secretary. Charles gets sort of confidential with me, too, Mr. Barnes. Oh? Excuse me, Mr. Barnes. Oh, yes, Charles? Uh, Judge Madison called over the other phone a few minutes ago. Said he'd been detained, but was coming right on over. Thank you. Oh, well, that's all for now, Miss Smith. Charles. Yes? Do you recognize the typing on this sheet of paper? Well, it, it's the same style, I think, as, as the typewriter I use. That's right. I typed this on your machine. What, what for? I mean... Well, it's just possible that under a microscope, it'll exactly match the typing on the extortion letter. Look, Mr. Barnes. I didn't have anything to do with it. We don't reach conclusions until we get all the facts. Why should I try to extort money from Mrs. Bradford? I'm well and taken care of in her will and... Uh, what? Help! 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 
Well, come on. Tom! It's Mrs. Bradford, Janet. She's been shot. Miss Darrell! I'm coming. <laughs> momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the strange extortion. We'll return to this case in just a moment. A quarter of a century ago, a great American president, Woodrow Wilson, saw the need for world cooperation. He urged the nations to get together, to drop their rivalries, to form a united front for world peace and security. Today, the ideals of this far-sighted leader are an inspiration to those who are planning to banish injustice, war, and aggression from the face of the earth. Members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will be proud to learn that this great advocate of international cooperation was a member of their society. Like Woodrow Wilson, this society also stands for security through cooperation. In fact, the Equitable Society is an excellent example of the advantages of cooperation. Instead of trying to struggle with their security problems alone and unaided, three and a quarter million Americans have joined forces in the equitable society. Instead of continually worrying about the financial future of their families, equitable members have shifted that burden onto the broad shoulders of their society. The peace of mind which they gain makes them better workers, better fathers or mothers, better citizens. Yes, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. So remember that name, the Equitable Society, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the file on the strange extortion. In the case of Letty Bradford, mailing the extortion letter was a federal offense. But when Mrs. Bradford was found apparently dying of a bullet wound above the right temple, Special Agent Hugh Barnes called Inspector Blanton of the Homicide Bureau, who took charge of the house and posted men to see that no member of the household tried to leave. Agent Barnes, however, continued to conduct the investigation. Letty Bradford's doctor, Inspector Blanton, Barnes, and the nurse, Janet Smith, herself under suspicion in connection with the letter, have been in Mrs. Bradford's room for some 30 minutes now. Judge Madison, who arrived shortly after the shooting, is standing outside in the hall with Charles Forbes, Mrs. Bradford's secretary. The door opens and Barnes steps out. Well, Mr. Barnes, Mrs. Bradford, The is bullet she... didn't penetrate as we thought at first. The pistol was evidently fired at such an angle as to cause only a deep scalp wound and severe powder burns. You mean... She's unconscious now, but largely from shock. She'll live. Oh. Judge Madison, did you ever see this gun before? Why, yes. Was that the pistol that was found on the floor behind her bed? That's Mrs. Bradford's pistol, Barnes. Mrs. Bradford's? I didn't know she had one. Yes, Charles. I bought it for her myself three weeks ago. Said she wanted one for protection, so I humored her. Thank you, gentlemen. You know where I can find Miss Darrell... Oh, yes. She went downstairs just before you came out, sir. I saw her going toward the library. Thanks, Charles. And, uh, Judge Madison. Yes? Inspector Blanton says no one is to leave the house just yet. If you'll excuse me now, please, sir. Look, Nick, it's not my fault if she doesn't die. I didn't do the shooting. What? What? Well, if she lives, you'll just have to give me more time. I can't raise $30,000 like an umbrella. All right, do anything you like about it. I didn't intend to eavesdrop, Miss Bradford. I didn't call Nick, Mr. Barnes. He called me to hound me about the money. I told him what had happened, and I... Oh, all right, believe what you like. I'm on my way to New York. I merely stopped to give you the doctor's verdict. Your aunt will live. Good night, Miss Bradford. Good 
Morning, Barnes. You don't look very happy. Ah, uh, just mixed up, I guess, Morley. No trace of the missing chauffeur yet. Not yet. What about the pistol? There are no fingerprints on it. I can't understand anybody leaving it behind the bed in the first place. And you got to her so fast, I don't see how they had time to escape. Well, they didn't use the window. That's a cinch. Do you suspect anyone in particular yet? Well, look, Morley, it's easy to suspect nearly everybody out there. Most all of them have acted funny about one thing or another. The nurse about the stationery, the secretary about the type, Daryl Bradford about $30,000. And they all stood to gain by Mrs. Bradford's death. Yes? Here's the laboratory report on the extortion letter, Mr. Barnes. Good. What's the verdict, Barnes? That's very interesting. The extortion note was typed on the secretary's machine. Yeah? And the only fingerprints on the letter are his. Oh, wait a minute. Here's something else. Also found on the stationery were microscopic traces of purple suede fuzz. Uh oh. As if it had been handled by someone wearing purple suede gloves. I'll take it. Barnes speaking. Oh, hello, Doctor. Yes? Yes, I see. I'll be there. Thank you very much. That's Mrs. Bradford's doctor. He wants to keep her quiet for the rest of the day, but says she should be able to talk to me by tonight. Good. In the meantime, I'm going to do a little checking on Nick today. And if you get any word on the chauffeur, call me at the Bradford house tonight. Right. Special Agent Barnes spent the rest of the day investigating the movements of the gambler Nick and his men during the past 24 hours, but could uncover nothing involving them with the shooting or the extortion letter. Shortly after dark, Barnes forged his car through a rain and windstorm sweeping Long Island up to the Bradford house. Letty Bradford could talk, but claimed she could remember nothing that happened. Barnes then assembled the others in the library. Charles. Yes, the extortion letter was typed on your machine. But, Mr. Barnes, I tell you And your you that... fingerprints were also found on the letter. Of course they were. I read the letter to Mrs. Bradford. I had to handle it to read it, didn't I? And, Miss Smith, your fingerprints were not found on the stationery used, but there were traces of fuzz from purple suede gloves. I never owned a pair of purple gloves in my life. And Mrs. Bradford was shot with a pistol which you say you bought for her, Judge Madison. Oh, good Lord, Barnes, you don't think I'm I... I'm not accusing you or anybody else here of anything, Judge. I'm merely setting down some facts, and I... Excuse me for butting in, Barnes. Morley, I thought you were in New York. Well, I thought I'd better bring him out instead of phoning. The police found our men. All right, come on in. Parker. Parker. I don't get the idea of all this. Are you Mrs. Bradford's chauffeur? Mrs. Bradford's ex-chauffeur. Oh, you're just the man I've been waiting to have a talk with. Will you come into the other room with me, please? Thirty minutes later, Special Agent Barnes emerged from his talk with the chauffeur, whispered something to Janet Smith, the nurse, who immediately set off upstairs. Then Barnes called Judge Madison to one side. Well, Barnes? I think I have it all cleared up now, Judge. Parker, the chauffeur? No, but he was very helpful. He... he knew something? Yes, something that completely clears Miss Darrell, the nurse, and Charles. Oh? I was finding it awfully hard to suspect any of them anyway. Why so? Well, Miss Smith wouldn't have been so obvious as to use her own stationery. For the same reason Charles wouldn't have typed the letter on his own machine. And Miss Darrow? Oh, she needed $30,000 all right, but she's too intelligent to have demanded a sum which everybody, including Mrs. Bradford, knew she owed to Nick the Gambler. Well, that sounds reasonable, but... Oh. I think I found what you want, Mr. Barnes. Yes. I'm afraid you have, Miss Smith. Judge, I think you'd yes. better come upstairs with me. All right. Mrs. Bradford? Well, what are you and Tom Madison up to? When you fired Floyd Parker three days ago, you gave him a handsome sum of money to soothe his feelings. Well, what if I did? It's my money. You also gave him a letter to mail. 
letter addressed to yourself. What are you trying to say, Are these young your man? purple suede gloves? Well, I, I... Oh, certainly they're mine. What are you doing with them? The person who wrote the extortion letter used Miss Smith's stationery, Charles's typewriter, the amount of Miss Darrell's gambling debt, and wrote it while wearing purple suede gloves. Well, what if they and did? And furthermore, she sought to escape an uncomfortable death from disease. At the same time, put the suspicion of murder on the beneficiaries of her will, whom she holds in contempt, by attempted suicide with a gun registered in Judge Madison's name. Well, Mrs. Bradford? All right. All right. I did it. It's all true. And I have only one regret. It didn't work. As a public servant charged with protecting the lives, property, and general welfare of all citizens, the FBI is just as diligent in establishing the innocence as well as the guilt of persons involved in a crime. In the case of Letty Bradford, there were five persons on whom the shadow of guilt fell. But Special Agent Barnes was not willing to arrest any one of them for the crime because of lack of sufficient incriminating evidence. Instead, his investigation was directed at removing from over them what shadow of suspicion was there. And in doing so, he discovered the person who was guilty. We'll hear about the disposition of this case in just a moment. But now, will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to the American industry which employs more men than any other except farming? An industry which is most typical of democracy and free enterprise because it is made up of many thousands of little businesses. A salute to the architects, engineers, lumbermen, the contractors, plumbers, electricians, masons, and carpenters who constitute America's great building construction industry. During the war, these were the men who built army camps and vitally needed factories almost overnight. During the post-war years ahead, this is the industry which will be the wheel horse of our national prosperity. Authorities estimate that the building construction industry will erect one million homes a year for the next ten years and will give employment to four to five million men. Today, the need for more manpower is acute in this industry, and it can be counted on to provide large numbers of jobs for ex-war workers and returning servicemen. For many years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has been closely associated with the building construction industry. Equitable Society funds have made possible the construction of countless homes, factories, and business buildings. Every time a member of the Equitable Society pays a life insurance premium, he knows that his money is helping to make jobs for millions of his fellow Americans. For just as Equitable Society dollars were fighting dollars in wartime, so at all times they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. <laughs> Because of her physical ailments and extreme old age, no formal charges were filed against Letty Bradford. Next week on the Equitable Society's presentation of This Is Your FBI, be sure to hear the adaptation of the forthcoming 20th Century Fox motion picture, The House on 92nd Street, relating the counter-espionage work of the FBI in protecting the secret of the atomic bomb. Featured on this broadcast will be the original stars of the picture, William Ive, Lloyd Nolan, and Signe Hassel. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets 
The music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for this is your FBI. Want to sit in on a thrilling court case? Well, then join the audience of famous jury trials which follows now over most of these stations. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, as a departure, we bring you the preview of a sensational motion picture, The House on 92nd Street, produced by 20th Century Fox, with the actual cooperation of the FBI. It reveals the most daring espionage plot of World War II. This dramatic screenplay stars William Ith, Lloyd Nolan, and Signe Hasso, and we have them here in person for our preview. This is your FBI presents... The House on 92nd Street. Back in 1939, the mechanized legions of Adolf Hitler were overrunning the face of Europe, crowding civilization into a dark corner. The ever-increasing number of Nazi booms in this country, the growing network of German spies, clearly indicated that Hitler would not stop at the borders of Europe. And so the FBI, always on the alert to protect the safety of the nation, went to work. Every known suspect was watched, their every move recorded for the files. The FBI could not declare open war against the treacherous Germans in this country, but it could and did keep a 24-hour watch on them, so that when the time came, those Nazis could do nothing to help Hitler make good his threat of Yesterday, Germany. Today, Europe. Tomorrow, the world. As our story opens on an afternoon in the spring of 1939, William Dietrich, a good-looking, husky young man, is standing near a pole vaulting pit on a college athletic field. He's in track uniform, and as he flexes his muscles before making his first jump, he is approached by two men. Pardon me. Are you William Dietrich? That's right. We would like to talk to you. What about? My name is uh, William Gross. How do you do? And uh, this is August Kaufman. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Kaufman. Dietrich, we came here to talk to you about, well, joining our society. What society is that? The German American Society. Oh? You are a good German. Your parents came from Stuttgart. You should join us. Well, I... Uh, Dietrich, you are going to graduate in June? Uh, yes, at least I think so. Well, would you like to take a trip back to Germany after you graduate? <laughs> no, I couldn't afford it. I have to go to work when I leave here. Oh, uh, the trip would cost you nothing. Uh, you, be, you would be paid, uh, in fact. Paid? Well, what would I have to do? Oh, Go to school in Germany for three months. What kind of school? A place where you will learn how to help the fatherland. Oh. And when you're finished there, you come back here to work for Germany. William 
Dietrich was a first-generation American, and like most first-generation Americans of German descent, he was a loyal citizen of this country, not a loyal Nazi. He asked the representatives of the German-American society to wait for his answer, because he had a plan. With that plan in mind, he telephoned the FBI in Washington. The next morning at FBI headquarters, William Dietrich was seated across the desk from Inspector George A. Briggs. Well, that's just about the whole story, Mr. Briggs. I see. I've had you checked since you called. You have? Yes. I find you can be trusted. And it's all set? I can really go? Oh, no, wait. Not so fast. Before you do anything, I have to tell you what you'd be up against. Well? If the Nazis should find out that you're working with us, they wouldn't think any more of killing you than of striking a match. And they only kill people they like with bullets. Yeah, I know that. And furthermore, the FBI doesn't command anyone to take his life in his hands. Well, that's why I called you, Mr. Briggs. I understand. When did your, uh, your friends, when did you tell them that you'd let them know? Wednesday night. Well, you've got almost a full week to make up your mind. After you give them an answer, call and let me know what that answer is. Mr. Briggs, I think I can save your phone call. I know what I'm going to tell them. Then let's go to work. After his graduation, William Dietrich left for Germany. Arriving at Hamburg, he went to the famous Nazi school in that city the school for spies and saboteurs. When he had learned his lessons well, he was ready to return to the United States. He was given counterfeit identification papers and some genuine credentials with which to introduce himself to the Nazi contact in New York. While he was still on the high seas, en route back to New York from Lisbon, Inspector Briggs and a special agent named Walker were busy at the FBI headquarters in Washington. Here's a report you should see, Walker. Oh? What's it about? A man was hit by a cab in New York three days ago. Some papers were found on him that looked suspicious, so they sent them down to us. Mm -hmm. He was carrying a forged passport, but his fingerprints show that he was Captain Franz von Wurt. Well, he's one of their top men. He was. He died on the way to the hospital. I see. Anything come out of his papers? Yes. We sent one of the letters he was carrying to the laboratory... They found some numbers written between the lines in disappearing ink. Cryptanalysis just broke it down. And? It said, concentrate on process 97. Well, that means nothing to me. It didn't to me either. So I called a meeting this morning of Army and Navy Intelligence. I read them the message. Any response? Oh, plenty. Process 97 is our new secret weapon. Oh. Nobody was even supposed to know that we were working on it. Well, what's our move? First, we've got to find out how much the Nazis know about it. And second, how they found out. Well, young Dietrich ought to be able to help us out on that one. Maybe, yes. His German credentials came in on Clipper this morning. I have them here. Oh, read them to me, will you? Now, they're in German and translated. They say, William Dietrich is specifically authorized to receive all reports for transmission direct. And that's the first paragraph. Uh-huh. Leave that one as it is. Right. Paragraph 2 says you're instructed to look to him for all payments. Well, that's fine. That means that they've got to come to him. Leave that one alone, too. Okay. The last paragraph says it is forbidden for him to have any contact with agents known to you. Mm, I don't like that. Now, let's see now. Uh, have it changed to read he is authorized to contact all agents known to you. Right. And after that, pack your bags. We're going to New York. A few days later, a Portuguese freighter came into New York Harbor. William Dietrich, one of the passengers, brought his luggage down under the pier, where it was checked by a customs inspector. The customs man was FBI Inspector George A. Briggs. As Briggs went through the bags, he quietly slipped Dietrich the new credentials. The forged credentials which would give Nazi spy and counter-espionage agent William Dietrich more freedom. When he left the pier, Dietrich took a cab to the house on 92nd Street. There he rang the bell and was admitted into the ground floor dress shop, 
a dress shop run by Elsa Gebhardt. You're Elsa Gebhardt? That's right. Well, they didn't tell me you were so pretty. Uh, who are they? Oh, pardon me, I'm sorry. My name is Bill Dietrich. Oh, I've been expecting you. Good. Here's a message for you from Colonel Strassen in Hamburg. Who's that, Elsa? This is William Dietrich. Ah, is he the new one? Yes, Max. He brought this message from Felix. He is William Dietrich. He's authorized to receive all reports for transition direct. He's authorized to pay our fee. He's author. He's authorized to contact all agents known to me. That's what Colonel Strassen said. But I don't understand. He never sent anybody else with orders like that. I'm going to check these credentials. Oh. I'll write to a friend of mine in Argentina. He'll get a message through to Hamburg. Okay, but meanwhile, I've got to go to work. What do you want? Enough parts to build a radio transmitter. Here's a list of what I need. Why don't you buy them yourself? I can't afford to be caught buying radio parts. He's right, Max. Here's the list. Get them. Okay. That will be all for now, Mr. Dietrich. Very well. Uh, don't go out through the front door. How then? Use this back door. And then walk out through the alley into 93rd Street. Okay. Goodbye, Miss Gebhardt. Goodbye. Max. Yeah? Follow him. William Dietrich got his radio parts and set up a transmitter in a secluded house on Long Island. He never transmitted to Hamburg, though. Every message he sent was picked up by a nearby receiver, a receiver operated by the FBI. After all harmful portions of the message had been removed, the FBI then shortwaved the rest in proper code to Germany. One day at this radio shack, Dietrich received an urgent summons from Elsa Gebhardt. She had to see him immediately. An hour later, he was in the house on 92nd Street. Dietrich. Yeah? I have something that must be sent as quickly as possible. Where is it? Here, in this envelope. Okay. If we hadn't done anything else in all the years we've been working, this information would make the whole thing worthwhile. But these are almost all numbers. They, they don't make sense. They'll make enough sense in Hamburg. I must have them back here by tomorrow night. Well, that's a tough assignment. Why? What makes it so tough? Well, I have to put all this in the code before I send it. That takes time. These are my orders. Well, why can't I, I just burn them when I'm finished? Because sometimes radio messages are garbled. When you're finished, I'll mail them to our drop in Argentine. It must get through. <laughs> Come in? Yes, come ahead, Walker. Anything on those papers Dietrich sent in? Yes. I spoke to Dr. Appleton. He's head of the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Those papers are definitely on process 97. What's more, he said the experiments took place just two days ago. What do we do now? Dr. Appleton is going to work on the papers. He says if you change one number, it can throw the Germans off for a month. Hmm. You know, I don't get this whole setup. I thought nobody working on the process was allowed to leave the plant. Nobody but a few of the scientists. They can leave a couple of nights a week. But they're thoroughly searched before they go. Mm. Look, uh, can you tell me what process 97 is? Well, I'll give it to you the way it was given to me. From what our scientists already know about its properties, it would devastate any city it was used against. Sounds like a death ray. I made the same guess. Is it right? No. Process 97 is an atomic bomb. <laughs> We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on The House on 92nd Street. We will return to this case in just a moment. You know the old saying, there's safety in numbers. Well, that's exactly the kind of safety enjoyed by members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. 
Each member of this society has three and a quarter million fellow members. From the premium dollars of this vast number of men and women has been built a gigantic protective fund. In managing this fund, the Equitable Society never forgets the principle of safety in numbers. So equitable dollars are put to work in a large number of different ways. In fact, it's difficult to mention a basic American industry in which equitable dollars do not play an important part. They are invested in farming and shipbuilding, in mining and railroading, in public utilities and steel mills, and hundreds of other worthwhile enterprises. Remember, complex as all these activities may be, the management of the Equitable Society has two simple objectives. First, to make it easy for those who become Equitable members to gain security for themselves and their families. Second, to make sure that Equitable funds are a force for good, always used to promote the industrial and financial health of this country. Thus, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the FBI file on The House on 92nd Street, starring William Ith, Lloyd Nolan, and Sidney Hosso. <laughs> On December 11th, 1941, Adolf Hitler declared that a state of war now existed between the United States and Germany. The FBI immediately arrested most of the known enemy agents. But Elsa Gebhardt and Max Coburg were allowed to continue their work because the FBI had to know. The very fate of the war we were fighting depended upon locating the leak through which Nazi Germany was getting the benefits of our experiments on the atomic bomb. Inspector Briggs in the FBI office in New York was trying to locate that leak. Briggs speaking. Inspector, this is Simmons. Yes? One of the scientists working on Process 97 is named Charles Ogden Roper. That's right. Well, he went out last night for a walk, and he went into town. Here in Manhattan? Yes, to Broadway and 123rd Street. He visited a girl named Louise Vaja. Who was Louise Vaja? He used to be a courier for the Nazis. Shall I pick up Roper? This looks like the goods. No, don't pick up Roper but arrest Luis Vaja. Miss Vaja, we've just been wasting our time. But I've been telling you the truth. Listen, you once worked as a hairdresser on the North German Lloyd Liner Europa, correct? Yes. You used to bring over letters and mail them when you got ashore. Well, I never knew what was in them. They were letters of instructions to German agents in this country. And you were working as a courier for the German Secret Service. No. We also know that you became an American citizen, and that, Miss Vaja, makes you a traitor. Well, I have done nothing since the war began. I swear you it. You have a friend who's a scientist. He's working for the government now. What's his name? I have no friend. He was at your home last night. His name is Charles Ogden Roper. <laughs> Now, let's have your story. Briggs speaking. This is Bill Dietrich. Oh, hello, Bill. Something new has been added, Mr. Briggs. What do you mean? I got a message from Hamburg to give to Elsa Gebhardt. What is it? It's about a man I never heard of before. The message says, remove the memory expert at the completion of his mission. Memory expert? Sorry? If that means what I think it does, Bill, this is the break we've been waiting for. Inspector Briggs was almost certain that Charles Ogden Roper was the memory expert, but he had to be sure. He checked Roper's birthplace, his college, his friends. Learning that years before he'd been in show business, he contacted many theatrical booking agents. In the office of one agent, a picture of Roper was found. A picture captioned, Charles Roper, Memory Wizard. That was the name of the act. And that was all Inspector Briggs needed. That afternoon at Dr. Appleton's laboratory. Dr. Appleton, why have I been brought here? This gentleman is from the FBI, Mr. Roper. The FBI? Mr. Roper, see if you recognize these photostats. Why, 
Why, they're photostats of the formula we worked on last week. I understand that you're one of the scientists privileged to leave the plant. A few evenings each week, yes, sir. A week ago tonight, you went out, didn't you? A week ago tonight? Yes. Last Friday night? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I did go out. I visited a friend's house. What for? To play chess. What's your friend's name? I don't remember. Oh, come now. The great memory experts, Charles Ogden Roper. You can't remember your friend's name? It's Louise. Louise Vaja. How long have you known him? Three years. A week ago, Mr. Roper, $5,000 was paid into your bank account. Why? I... I sold some securities. Dr. Appleton, why does he ask me all these questions? Uh, this gentleman thinks you memorized parts of the formula before you left here. That's not true. And when you got to your friend's house, you set them down? No. We know all about you, Roper. We've traced you back to the day you were born. We even know the approximate date that you're scheduled to die. Die? Listen to this. It's an intercepted message direct from Germany. It says, remove the memory expert at the completion of his mission. Oh. What do you want to know? When did you make your last delivery? This morning, on my way back to work. Where did you make it? At a bookshop. Which one? Come on now, Robo. Talk up. Talk fast. Lang's Bookshop, 59th Street. I put the material in a book, Spencer's First Principles. What did you give him? What was it, Roper? It was the latest data on the final experiments. After Roper's confession that he was in league with a Nazi spy ring, the FBI went to Lang's bookstore on East 59th Street. Mr. Lang did not know anyone named Roper. He had never heard of anyone named Louise Vodger. His shop contained no copy of a book called Spencer's First Principles. It was gone. Is that you, Max? Yeah. Did you get the book? Uh-huh. Do you want me to take it to Dietrich? No. Why not? I received a letter from Argentine this morning about Dietrich. His credentials were forged. What? He's on his way here. I expect him any minute. Then I go to work on him, eh? No. Why not? He must be made to talk. I can make him talk. You'd kill him. That would serve no purpose. I have a much better plan. What? This hypodermic needle contains scopolamine. It drugs part of the brain. Yeah? After three injections, he'll be answering questions. Ah. I'll allow you to put him in proper condition to receive the first injection. Thanks. See who it is. It's Dietrich. He's coming back to this room. Good. Let him in, Max. Hello. Come in, Dietrich. Oh, thanks. All right, Max. <clears throat> oh. Now let's go to work. Talk, you swine. Talk. Stop it, Max. Give the medicine a chance to work. You see? He's coming out of it. Now he should talk. Dietrich, what is your real name? What is your real name? He's lying. Wait. Dietrich, you didn't send our messages to Hamburg, did you? Did you? No, no. You see, Max, it's working. Where did you send them? Uh, uh, 30 miles. Boy, the Max! Dietrich, who did you send our messages to? Who were you working with? Answer me. Who were you? The house phone. Someone's in the shop. I'll take it. 
Yes? Miss Gephardt? Who is this? I'm an FBI agent. Your house is surrounded. What's the matter? It's the FBI. They have the house surrounded. What? Quick. Take all the papers. Throw them in, into the fireplace. Well, what about him? Do as I say. You've got to get out of here. Open up, Miss Gephardt. Open the door. Now, what'll we do? Get your gun. Keep them out, Max. Keep them out, Max. You take care of those two, Simons. Right. Bill. Bill. How is he? Well, he's passed out. He's evidently drugged. Look, you'd better get a doctor, Walker. I'll stay here. Okay. When he comes to, I want to be around to tell him that Process 97 still belongs to us. <laughs> Thanks to the courageous work of the FBI, Process 97 remained in the possession of this country. Ultimately, it, would, it was used as the atomic bomb. Before and during this war, the FBI was able to protect this secret. But someday an enemy may discover the formula of atomic power in his own laboratories. If he does and he decides to go to war, then World War III will be over in 15 minutes. The discovery of the atomic bomb places a tremendous responsibility on the people of the entire globe. It was true when the late Wendell Wilkie said, this is one world. Now in this atomic age, the countries of the earth must get along together. Because now, it will be one world or none at all. the disposition of this case in just a moment. Tonight, will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to an industry which will play a key role in building the better world of tomorrow? A salute to the scientists and workers in America's chemical industry. The outstanding wartime achievements of this industry are too numerous to mention. So let's take only one, the atomic bomb. The chemical industry made a major contribution toward unleashing the enormous power of the atomic bomb. Right now, this industry enters into your daily life in a thousand different ways. Consider the food you eat. Its growth was aided by chemical fertilizers and insecticides. The clothes on your back, the shoes on your feet, the ink in your fountain pen, the paint on your walls. To all these and scores of other articles of everyday use, Chemicals and chemical research make vital contributions. And it is to the chemical industry that thousands of other industries look for expert aid in developing the improved post-war products that will make life happier and easier for all of us. Members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will be proud to learn that their premium dollars have helped finance this great industry and that over the years... Equitable society funds have been invested in many of the great chemical plants that did so much to help win the war and will do even more to win the peace. Just as equitable society dollars were fighting dollars in wartime, so at all times they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. <laughs> Elsa Gebhardt and her confederate Max Coburg, upon trial and conviction, joined their fellow Nazi agents in a federal penitentiary. The incidents in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the 20th Century Fox exciting drama, The House on 92nd Street soon to be seen in all the nation's motion picture theaters, starring William Ith, Lloyd Nolan, and Sidney Hasso. This breathtaking story was adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Leith Stevens. The radio adaptation was by Jerry Lewis, and your narrator was Reed Hadley. 
This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Dick Joy speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for This is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Marriage Racket. In the years that have just finished their parade into the history books, the people of the world became accustomed to the cruel reality of having the earth fertilized with the blood of millions of soldiers. Sudden violent death became the normal thing. The pages of every newspaper carried their mournful honor rolls. But that was war. That was a crime all of civilization was guilty of having committed. That was a crime the FBI could neither prevent nor solve. But now we've come upon a period of peace. A period when the FBI can and does prevent crimes. Above all others, it's most important that the FBI and all law enforcement agencies prevent one certain crime. Because once that crime has been committed, all that remains is catching and punishing the criminal. The victim is beyond saving. This crime is murder. Our story tonight takes us to a pleasant farming community in Iowa. Chris Newton, who owns 200 acres of the best land in the county, has just returned home from the city with a new wife. This is their first day together at home. Della? I'm in the kitchen, honey. Oh. Well, something smells good. <laughs> Chicken. With dumplings? With dumplings. Golly. You just get over that wash up or everything's just about ready. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? I, I got something for you. Kind of like a surprise. For me? Mm-hmm. Here. Chris. Go on. Open it. Sure. Chris. It ain't much. Why, it's the most beautiful set of feathers I ever seen in my life. The man says you can wear them on your head or around your neck. <laughs> it don't make no difference which. Oh, they're just beautiful. Chris, you're so awful good to me. Well, I just feel lucky I got you. Even in spite of what folks in town will say? What do you mean? Well, I know they're thinking you ought to have picked your wife from around here instead of marrying a stranger. Della, a man's got a right to marry whoever he wants to. If he can get her, I wanted you, and I got you. You mean I got you? <laughs> then we're even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris. Ah, now you go over and get cleaned up, and I'll set... Who's that? Must be Jeff Holmes. I asked him to drop by. Come in. Hiya, Della. George! Who's he? George, it's my brother. Come in, George. Come in. Okay. For heaven's sakes, how'd you get here? Hitchhike. Chris, this is my brother, George. George, this is my husband, Chris. Hello, George. Hiya. Well, this is a surprise. It is to me, too, Della. I didn't know you had a brother. Well, she probably forgot. I ain't seen her in a couple of years. You been in the Army? No, working in war plants up and down the coast. How'd you find out where I was? Well, Uncle Ben told me. I uh, hear you two have just been married. Uh-huh. Congratulations. Thanks. 
George, you look very peaked. Have you been sick? No, just tired. I need a little rest and uh, some fresh air. That's why I came here. Well, bless you, George. I'm glad you did. You think you'd like some company for a while? Oh, of course. We'd love to have you, wouldn't we, Chris? Sure, You're just in sure. time for something to eat. Let me have your coat, George. I'll keep it on. Which room do I use? You take the one at the end of the hall on the left. Can I give you a hand with your suitcase? No, thanks. I'll go change my clothes, sis. Bella. Yeah, Chris? You don't suppose uh, your brother's in some kind of trouble, do you? Trouble? What do you mean? Well, you saw how he acted when I offered to take his coat. Yeah. You notice that bulge in his coat up near the shoulder? No, why? Bella, your brother's packing a gun. The smallest clue may lead to solving the biggest crime. And so the FBI is always careful to check every lead supplied them by alert local police forces. The day that Della's brother George came to visit his sister, the police in Des Moines picked up an abandoned car bearing an Oregon license plate. Checking, they found that the car had been stolen the week before in Portland. The Des Moines office of the FBI was notified, and within a matter of minutes, special agents Adams and Kendall were on the scene, going over the car with a fine-tooth comb. I see. Whoever abandoned the car intended staying in the vicinity a while. What do you think, Bob? Uh-huh. You find anything in the back? Oh, just a couple of newspapers so far. Well, while you're looking around, I'll start getting a few fingerprints. Ought to get some clear ones off the doors anyway. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What'd you find? Marry me. What? Yeah, oh, it's a magazine. Slipped behind the seat. Marry me? Uh, one of those, uh... Lonely Heart Things, published in Chicago. I can't imagine a car thief having a magazine like that. Here's the name of a woman subscriber, Stencil on it. Now, who is she? Well, it was originally addressed to Adela Williams in Chicago, but it was forwarded to uh, Mrs. Henry Lewis, Portland, Oregon. A lonely Heart must have found a mate. But it wasn't the owner of this car. His name's Hancock. You know, we'd just better take this magazine along with us. Okay. Uh, help me get a few fingerprints, Bob. We'll get them off to Washington. husband go, Della? Outside to look after the stock. Oh. Then it's time we did a little talk. Oh, but he may come back any minute, George. And he's already very suspicious of you. What do you mean? He knows you're carrying a gun. How? You gave it away acting like you did about your coat. Ah, I'll fix that. Uh, you think you got a good sucker this time? Chris is such a wonderful man, George. I don't mean that, stupid. How's uh, the dough department? Oh, they say he's worth more than any farmer in the county. Oh, good, good. Then we'll go right to work. I don't want to stay around here any longer than I have to. But it's very nice here, George. I like Del, it. Uh, shut up and listen, will you? Okay. I ran into a drug the other day that's out of this world. Now, you do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it, and everything will be... Oh, everything all right out back, Chris? Yeah, just fine, Della. Oh, uh, say, Chris. Yes? I I brought a little present for you. No? What's that? A gun I used on a night watching job out west. A gun? Oh. It uh, might be useful to you around here. Well, thanks, George, but I don't think I need it. <laughs> At least you know why George was carrying it now, don't you, Chris? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I'll be getting on to bed. Come, Mandela? Uh, right away, Chris. Night, George. Night. Well. That took care of that. And tomorrow, honey, we break in the new drug. Sorry I took so long for lunch, Bob. Anything from Washington on those fingerprints? No, not yet. But I just finished talking to Portland about Della Williams. Huh? What'd you get? She married a man named Henry Lewis three months ago. He died suddenly one month ago. 
She collected $3,500 insurance and left Portland right away. Uh, anything strange about the death? Mm-hmm. Overdose of uh, sleeping tablets. They let it go as a suicide. Ah. But what's that got to do with a stolen car? Della Williams met Lewis through that Lonely Heart magazine. Yeah. And Della has a brother who lived with him for a time. What's his name? They didn't know. You think maybe the brother stole the car because we found his sister's magazine in it? Certainly seems plausible. Yeah, that's right. It's Washington's report on those fingerprints. Oh, thanks, Tom. Well, what's the verdict? You hit the jackpot, Bob. Oh. The man who stole the car is George Williams. Served two years for robbery. Last lived with Sister Della Williams in Chicago. He's 35, 5 feet 10, and... Bob. Yeah? Maybe Lewis didn't commit suicide after all. Listen to this. Williams and sister suspected of murder in connection with death of her four former husbands, but not enough evidence was ever found to warrant their indictment. Oh, marry and murder for profit. Yes. And if that's their business, they're probably already started on the next victim. And since Williams abandoned his stolen car in Des Moines, their next victim must be somewhere in this area. Right. If we want to save somebody's life, Bob, let's get busy. What a supper. Oh, Chris. I mean it. George, your sister's about the finest cook that ever hit these parts. <laughs> yeah, she does okay. Oh, now stop that talk, both of you. <laughs> How about some more coffee? Yeah, just fill it right up, Della. Okay. You want some, George? Uh, no, thanks. I had enough. I think I'll take another biscuit if you got some more handy. Why, sure. <laughs> You're the best dog gun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Chris. Oh. What's the matter, oh. Chris? Oh, my... My, my heart. Heart. I, I can't... Can I do anything? Oh. Get... Get Dr... Dr. Matthews. He's out. Shall I call the doctor? Sure, why not? This has got to be a very legitimate murder. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on The Marriage Racket. We will return to this case in just a moment. One of the best things about being in the life insurance business is that you get to know a lot of different people. For instance, in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, our circle of friends is a very wide circle indeed. It consists of three and a quarter million individuals. That's the number of men and women who have become members of our society. And since the Equitable Society is a society in fact, as well as in name and is entirely owned by its policyholders, our members never hesitate to speak up when they have something on their minds. They tell it to our agents or write personal letters to President Parkinson. Farmers give us their ideas on our farm insurance programs. Heads of great industrial enterprises volunteer their opinions on our group insurance plans. Fathers of families tell us their special needs in regard to home protection, the education of the children, or retirement income for themselves. Here in the Equitable Society, we consider it a great advantage to have our fingers constantly on the public's pulse. Thanks to these contacts, we are able to modernize and liberalize our life insurance policies and annuity contracts. We have streamlined them to give our members protection and security exactly suited to their needs. That is why the Equitable Life Assurance Society's many services are always up to date, planned with an eye to the future. On the same principle... In investing Equitable Society dollars, our management always keeps in mind the future economic health and prosperity of the entire nation. And so, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on The Marriage Racket. <laughs>
George Williams, with that sublime ego which drives all criminals to the belief that they're too smart for the police, had stolen a car and driven it across a state line. That was a mistake. A serious mistake. Because it invited the FBI to take a hand in stopping his career. This was not the ordinary chase after a criminal. This was not a race between Williams and the FBI. This was a race between the FBI and death. On the Newton farm, Dr. Matthews has been treating his patient. And now he emerges from the bedroom. Doctor, how is he? Is he going to pull out of it, Doc? Well, I have relieved his pain. His pulse seems to be a little more regular. Then he's going to be all right. I think he'll get over this attack. But he must have quiet and rest for a few days. Oh, we'll see that he gets it, Doc. My sister will take good care of him. Of course. Chris is such a wonderful man. There's not a finer man in the whole community, Mrs. Newton. And I'm doubly sorry that this should happen so soon after... after your marriage. I can't understand it. Chris is as strong as an ox. He told me himself he'd never been sick a day in his life. Well, he's worked mighty hard all his life. I guess the strain is beginning to tell. Anything uh, especially you want us to do, Doc? No, no, just keep him quiet. I'll drop by to see him tomorrow. Oh, thank you for coming, Doctor. Well, I'm glad you could reach me. Good night, Mrs. Newton. Good night. Uh, uh, Doc. Yes? Suppose uh, he has another attack and we can't reach you. What do we do? Well, there's not much you'd be able to do except hope for the best. Yeah. I guess so. Good night. Good night, Doc. Well, honey, we just have to give the sucker one more dose. Hey, Bob. Yeah? Any police reports on that alarm we put out on Williams yet? No, and time is ticking away fast. Yeah, I know. If Marion murder is their game, we're racing against the death of their next victim. If we haven't already lost the race. Well, we're not getting anywhere waiting for reports. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Why haven't we thought of it before? What? That Lonely Heart magazine. If they contacted their other victims through the magazine... Hey, give me the phone. Calling Chicago? Yeah. I'll get the editor to give me a list of all the men in this area who've been trying to find a bride through the magazine. Uh, hello, operator. Uh, get me the editor of a magazine published... In... How's he doing, sis? Chris is sleeping, George. That's good. We want a little time for the news to get around that he had a heart attack, so nobody will be surprised when another one kicks him off. I know. Ah, that's beautiful stuff in those little capsules. What's in them? It's a drug we should have been using all the time. A little bit kicks the pump around and too much stops it for keeps. And it's scientifically impossible to find a trace of it in the body. George. Yeah? Chris is such a wonderful man. Okay, you said that before. So what? Would you be awful mad if I asked you to do something for me? Like what? Well, Chris is such a, a wonder wonderful man. All right, all right. You said that. He's been so good and kind to me. I wish you'd let Nothing him... Nothing doing. Please, George, I want to stay married this time. I said nothing doing. But, George, Look, you Look, you got a crush on a couple of your other husbands, too, but you got over it. Yeah, I know. But Chris is different. You said the same thing about that guy, Brown. Well, they both touched the mother in me, I guess. And that last guy, Lewis. You had a big thing for him, too. I couldn't help it. He was such a gentleman. Look, honey, this is strictly business, see? Chris has got a lot of rocks salted away. And we can sell the farm for another pile. George, please. No dice. We gotta go through with this, Della. But I'll tell you what. I promise you, the next guy you like, you can keep. Okay? You mean it, George? It's guaranteed. Oh, you're the sweetest brother a girl ever had. Well, here we are, Bob. The names of four marriage prospects in this area scattered all over the state. Well, let's get on them right away. And we'd better try telephoning. And ask them what? 
If they found a mate? <laughs> we won't be that blunt about it. Let's take them right on down the line. Reeves, Johnson, Mason, and Newton. George? George? Yeah? The telephone's ringing. What'll I do? Leave it alone. No, wait. I'd better answer it. You stay here. Hello? Is this the Newton residence? Yeah. I'm sorry to bother you this time of night, but... Who is this? Are you Mr. Newton? No. Mr. Newton's sick. Very sick. In bed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Good night. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you? Hey, hello. Hello. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. Hello. If you want Dr. Matthews, he's not here. Then uh, maybe you can help me. I'm not a doctor. I'm just the housekeeper. Well, we're very sorry to disturb you, but uh, we're special agents of the FBI. The FBI? But gracious, what's the matter? We want to ask you about a patient of Dr. Matthews, Mr. Newton. Oh. Well, the uh, doctor went out there about supper time. The uh, station agent said Mr. Newton had a heart attack. Maybe so. The doctor don't discuss his patients with me. You'll have to wait till he gets back. When will that be? No telling. He drove 50 miles out in the country to deliver Mrs. Weaver's baby. Could we uh, reach the doctor by telephone? You could, if the Weavers had a telephone. Do you know if Mr. Newton got married recently? I said the doctor don't discuss his patients with me. You'll just have to wait for him. You got his tray ready, sis? All I have to is pour his coffee. Wait a minute. Let's uh, sweeten the cup a little bit. Oh, George, I hate to do this. Yeah, 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 I know. Now, pour in the coffee. Okay. This one's going to last him a long time. Come on. Okay. Chris, honey, I got something to eat for you. Thanks, Stella. I'm real hungry, too. How you feeling, Chris? Fit as a fiddle. I don't see why I have to stay in this bed. Well, it's a doctor's orders, pal, and you're going to stay there if we have to stand over you with a shotgun. <laughs> it's nice of you, George, to want to do what's right about me. Now, but... look, Chris, look. Della's a happy dame, and I want to see her stay that way. Here's your tray, Chris. Thanks. Now, who's that? Oh, probably neighbor. Well, Chris ain't supposed to have company. I'll get rid of him. Uh, go on, eat, Chris. I'll take care of him. Okay, okay, okay. I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, are uh, you Mr. Newton? Mr. Newton's sick and can't have company. I don't think it'll be necessary for us to see him. Then what do you want? I think we want you, Mr. Williams. Huh? We're special agents of the FBI. Where's your sister? I don't know what you're talking about. You... No, you dropped that gun. George! George, who are these men? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? You and your brother are under arrest. Oh, dear. Where are you going? I've got to throw out some coffee. Murder in any form is offensive to the civilized mind. We are incensed by the killing committed in a fit of passion, by the bank robber's killing of an innocent teller, by the brutal murder committed by the mental or moral degenerate. But there are no words to describe our revulsion for the persons who commit deliberate cold-blooded murder for profit. Investigation into the deaths of the former husband of Della Williams proved conclusively that murder had been committed in each case. Thanks to the speed with which the FBI worked, the life of Chris Newton was saved. And George Williams and his sister were tried by local authorities and convicted of murder in the first degree. In the long roster of criminals, they were fairly unimportant people. 
But the file on their case proves once again that crime is not a profitable profession and can never become profitable so long as lawbreakers are being fought relentlessly by the FBI. about next week's case in just a moment. Tonight, will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to America's dairy industry, to the farmers, milk companies, and their tens of thousands of employees? Above all, a special salute to the boys and girls of the dairy farms. During the war, while a father or elder brother was at the front, these patriotic kids got up at dawn to feed the cows and gave up their playtime hours to get the milk through to the milk processing plants. Thanks to tireless efforts of both youngsters and old-timers on the dairy farms, it was never necessary to point ration the milk that means so much to the nation's health. In fact, per capita consumption of milk went up 25% during the war, and wherever it was humanly possible, milk and milk products were regular parts of the army ration. Milk and ice cream were symbols of home, the things our boys wanted most. Now that peace is here, America's dairy industry is looking forward to making greater contributions to our country's nutrition and health than ever before. In the future also, there will be an increasing number of appetizing new food products, even wearing apparel, all made from milk. Over a long period of time, funds of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States have played an important part in dairying. Hundreds of dairy farmers in all parts of the country have taken advantage of the Equitable Society's many plans for the business of farming. In addition, the premium dollars of Equitable members are invested in a number of the leading dairy companies. Just as Equitable Society dollars were fighting dollars in wartime, so at all times, they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. Next week's colorful and exciting story will be based on the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the serviceman swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Leith Stevens. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Reed Hadley, who appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Dick Joy speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. Friends, for your unfaltering courage during the war years, you've won and you deserve your country's highest citation. Through the days of conflict, your contributions were limitless and your victory decisive. But the only complete victory is victory with responsibility. And to that end, our work continues. Every individual in America has a stake in the job of converting to peacetime economy as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Soon, price controls may no longer be necessary to our economic well-being. But until that time, go on doing your level best. Spend sensibly and avoid buying goods which are still in short supply. Cooperate with the remaining price and rationing controls. And if a question arises over any point of cost, refer it immediately to your Office of Price Administration. America's war against inflation is still raging. Remember, the most important single contribution we can make to world prosperity and peace is a stable economy here at home. This is the American Broadcasting Company.